Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's Critical Thinking webinar. We are happy to have you join us today and hope that you and your entire Tiger family are well. Before I turn it over to the program to our MC, Rick Lajewski, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, special thanks to our interpreters this evening, Nicole and Cheryl. Thank you so much, Nicole and Cheryl. Uh, Zoom webinar platform attendees will not be able to interact via video or audio. Only panelists will be broadcasting via video and audio. Tonight's webinar is being recorded. Attendees are welcome to interact through the Q&A functionality located in the bottom <laughs> toolbar throughout the webinar. We will address questions at the end of the program. You can select your viewing preference in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, select gallery view for the best viewing experience. With that, I'll turn it over to our MC and Saunders faculty member, Rick Lajewski, to begin this evening's program. Thank you so much, Rick. Thanks, Bill. Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar, Critical Thinking, Hospitality and Tourism in Times of Crisis. Tonight's webinar is sponsored by RIT Alumni Relations, RIT Fram Chair in Applied Critical Thinking, Saunders College of Business, and RIT's Collaboratory for Resilience and Recovery. Again, my name is Rick Legeski. I'm an assistant professor in the Saunders College of Business, Department of International Hospitality and Service Innovation. Why critical thinking? Our global society now comes with expectations. Simply knowing is not enough. Leaders must think critically to assess and strategize within complex interconnected systems and processes. Continually adapt to rapid evolving technological, aesthetic and social environments and manifest new ideas, both individually and collectively. Applied critical thinking at RIT is cultivated through learning expectations of defining the quality of information, analyzing, developing a point of view, solving complex problems and the creation of solutions. These elements are embedded into our curriculum and practiced intentionally in ever broadening and diverse environments of experiential learning, such as RIT's renowned co-op employment, community service learning, international experiences, entrepreneurship, research, and the participation in student groups in and out of the classroom. These skills transfer into every other area of life and are the impetus for growth, professionalism, and creative expression, empowering our alumni to realize their contribution to our world through whatever path they choose or aim to create. We are very excited and grateful to have three experienced alums as our panelists today to share their assessments of the current pandemic, the adaptions they have made, and new and evolving ideas and solutions. So let's get started with introducing our panel members today. Our first panel member today is Harvey Stern, Executive Director of Catering, Wedding Chapel, and Group Dining at de Blasio. Harvey, could you tell us about your current position and how business was before the pandemic? and maybe a little bit about what the moment was when it was clear this crisis was going to have a major impact on your operations. Thank you, Rick. Good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Privileged to be here alongside with uh, Rick and Scott. Thank you to all of you for your, your time and interest. I just started my 19th year at Bellagio. Again, as Rick said, I'm executive director of catering, wedding chapel, and group dining. And like all of you, this has been a difficult and tough year, especially in the sales, catering, and services space. For those of you who have visited Bellagio, you know the scale and the scope of the mega resorts. Bellagio is a five diamond, 4,000 room key, 200,000 square foot of convention space, 156,000 square feet of convention floor, 25 plus restaurants, bars, and lounges, in a 2,000 person showroom that has a permanent show, oh, by Cirque du Soleil. And by physical size, we are far from the biggest property on the strip. While I cannot provide the financial information of exact dollars, but we're only a few resorts that produce total revenue north of $1 billion in 2019. In January and February, business was as expected, stellar. I think that was shared by most in Vegas and around the country. This was going to be a great year, record setting. And then 
OMG. Our first coronavirus talk was around the beginning of February as we prepared to do our Chinese New Year celebration. This event is a seven course Chinese dinner, traditional style, family style, with 2,500 VIP casino guests. And with over 500 front and back of house employees working the event, it became a very challenging event in the face of what was concerning about the coronavirus. So we took health and safety precautions as we knew then what we could do. The event went off without a hitch and happy to report that there was not one illness from a guest or employee as a result of that event. And we continued to busy as, as, as you know, we started. And then towards the end of February, we again got to hear concerns and planning opportunities. And we heard a lot more starting at the beginning of March. We actually learned the official closing just, before, just days before it occurred. And it was a moving and surreal set of, of, meeting leading up to, of meetings leading up to that closure. Now Bellagio has had some experience with closures already. We literally closed our property for three and a half days in April of 2004 due to electric failure. And then we did portions of the property over time since then. So we kind of had a partial playbook to work from. But think just for a moment, what goes into closing a resort like Bellagio and all the other resorts up and down the Las Vegas Strip in a matter of days? Every guest and reservation had to be contacted rebooked, canceled, and we didn't even know a return date to reopen. Every room, the front of house, the back of house, all had to be checked and verified that our employees and our guests were out of the building. All the chips and the cash had to be removed from the casino. And then food and beverage had to be gathered from every kitchen, every pantry, every location, sorted, shared, or discarded. Hotel, housekeeping, EVS, had 4,000 rooms and millions of square feet of public space to get ready. Retail had an inventory and secure, and then HR worked with every division and employee, and employee processes, including furlough, insurance, unions. And security had to figure a way to secure the buildings. And we don't have locks on those doors because they never close. The tasks of closing these buildings were daunting but laid out in process, and we officially closed on March 17th, 2020. Thanks, Harvey, that's great, I appreciate it. Our next panelist today is Rick McGowan, Complex General Manager at Ocean Properties, Key West, Florida. Rick, could you give us a little bit of background in terms of your role in Key West and what things were like prior to the pandemic? and what it was like that moment you found out that this was a little bit bigger than just a short-term event. Thanks, Rick, I appreciate it. Um, as you were alluding to, I'm, I'm in the Florida Keys. I oversee three hotels, uh, a restaurant, as well as a marina, um, a variety of hotels, full service, limited service, and an independent, and a couple of branded hotels. Um, the, the market of the Florida Keys is generally very busy. Um, a bit different than Harvey is, is the number of rooms. Um, the hotels are usually a little bit smaller, but the Florida Keys is generally one of the highest RevPAR markets in the, in the country. Um, leading up to the events, uh, certainly following everything online and, and via the news sources, um, I traveled to to the Rochester area for a wedding on March 11th. Um, had a little hesitation about going. I thought things might get might get serious. Um, it was an early morning flight. When we landed, they had announced that the NBA season had been canceled. And my wife and I were kind of wondering whether we made the right decision. <laughs> um, but they also shortly after had started to put in travel restrictions into New York. Um, and then upon coming back, it was um, a couple of days later is when they had, had put in the closure. Uh, the Florida Keys is accessed really by two ways. Either you fly into Key West or you take the overseas highway and drive in. Um, the county had put in a, a roadblock, a checkpoint to keep visitors out. 
um, because it is a, a purely a leisure destination. Um, and that's, that's really how we kind of got right into it in, in March. Fantastic. Thanks, Rick. Finally, Scott Ingwers, Regional Vice President at Trump Hotels, Honolulu County, Hawaii. Scott, obviously you're out there on an island. Um, could you give us a little bit of your background and uh, when you knew things were really serious? Sure, Rick. Um, I'm originally from Rochester. I've been out in Hawaii for the better part of 26 years and the past 12 years on the island of Oahu as managing director for Trump International Hotel Waikiki, which is a condominium hotel uh, right in the heart of the main vacation destination for Hawaii. Um, for the past five years, I've also been overseeing resort operations for the brand for resorts in uh, Doral, Miami, Las Vegas, uh, Dunebeg, Ireland, and Turnberry, Scotland. And also involved in the planning for two emerging resorts in Indonesia, one in Bali and one on the island of Java outside of Jakarta. So speaking with regard to the property here in Waikiki, uh, we are a pure leisure destination driven resort and our largest market is the high-end luxury Japan market. To a lesser degree, North America, West Coast of the US, uh, Korea, Australia, other, other source markets. But Japan is by far our most important. Um, so when, when we started the year, January and February to Harvey's point were exceptional months. They were the best January and February that we have ever seen at this property over the course of 12 years. I recall reading an article in February that alluded to the potential for a global pandemic. And it was one of those things that you read and you sort of discount like, wow, that's scary. I can't imagine that's going to happen. I hope the, the author of this article is, uh, is without credit. Well, March rolls around and our governor, uh, for all intent and purposes, shuts off Hawaii from the rest of the world. Now we're the, the most re remote land mass in the world, furthest away from any other land mass. And basically what the governor did was say, if you're going to fly into Hawaii, you have to quarantine for 14 days, either inside your hotel room without ever leaving over the course of the 14 days or at your place of residence. And that basically took what was shaping up to be the most stellar year in our 12 year history and everything just dropped off the cliff. Wow. Yeah. Well, I think you um, alluded to our, our next point. Obviously we've seen the pandemic has mostly been left to the states to manage. So I thought we could just explore that a little bit. So. Rick, um, obviously you're, you're in Florida and could you talk a little bit about sort of how Florida's maybe managed or handled the pandemic and, and how that's influenced how you've run your operations um, since this time in March? Uh, a lot of it was with capacity changes. Um, social distancing was, was one of the big ones is still, um, but the capacity, they limited um, how many guests could be at a bar, how many could be in a restaurant. So we had to really take seats away, put out different kind of coasters. This seat's on, this seat's not on. Um, and to look at ways to, to make the experience with the guest still seem seamless where it was, where it was a safe environment. Um, but navigating the, the different forms of communication uh, coming out from the governor to the individual counties. Um, as I mentioned, they shut off the access to the keys with the exception of residents, workers, um, and contractors. So there was a police checkpoint coming into the 18 mile stretch into the Florida Keys um, that there was no access to. Um, and with that, the business quiets down, um, comes to a, a dull roar. We had one hotel that remained open that had um, really essential workers. The other hotels closed for most purposes with the exception of the booking engine, which we kept open 
and really shifted business to the other hotel to, um, to limit costs and things like that. Um, restaurant, the full service restaurant completely closed. Uh, the marina, which had um, liveaboards, fishing charters, things like that, uh, was able to remain open um, without any uh, restrictions on it. But really the, the capacities in which we could operate um, were, were really limited. Gotcha. Thanks. Scott, you mentioned that the, uh, the governor basically had, had closed off Hawaii. Um, I know there's been some, you know, changes over the months in terms of how Hawaii's managed um, access um, uh, to the state as a destination. Can you talk a little bit about how you've managed sort of those changing, um, those changes within the government? Sure. So, you know, there's, there's been countless mandates, um, from both the mayor and the governor over the past seven, eight months. Uh, when we originally shut down on the 21st of March, we were given five days. I'm sorry, when it was announced on the 21st, we were given five days until that took effect. So during that time, the hotels emptied out, everybody went home, and then you were subject to that 14 day quarantine. And that remained in effect basically all the way up until October 15th, Rick. So we've been basically running with local business. And by local here, you, you know, you have to realize that we're not like Las Vegas where people can drive in from Los Angeles. We're limited to the people who actually live on the island, number one. And number two, who can afford to stay at a five-star hotel even with reduced room rates. Um, so it became very difficult to keep our, our staff, which was probably the most difficult uh, aspect of this entire situation. Uh, we were forced to furlough many people because even with local business, we couldn't support um, keeping so many people on the payroll. Uh, and as the summer progressed, as uh, similar to many other destinations or, or places around the world, um, we went into uh, a lockdown whereby stay-at-home orders were issued we couldn't go anywhere, which means all of the local business dried up. Uh, fortunately for us, we're a condominium hotel, so we have residents who are living in the building. So there is a, a small amount of staff that's necessary to operate the building on a day-to-day -day basis. But for the most part, we've been really down to single digit occupancies. And in some many cases, low single digit for much of this period, um, up until October 15th. And when that date occurred, now you're able to bypass that 14 day quarantine if you have a negative COVID test result upon arrival in Hawaii. Um, so that, that was tremendous for us. All the way up until a couple of weeks later when the governor put out another mandate stating that you have to have the negative test prior to boarding the plane. Before that, you could fly in, if you didn't have your test results, you could go to your hotel and quarantine for a day or two until you receive them. Now, you have to have the negative test in your hand and have taken it within 72 hours of departure to Hawaii. So now what we see is cancellations across the board, the holiday period, the year end period, which is normally our busiest, is now fallen off uh, and it's, we're, we're sort of regressing, I guess you could say, backwards uh, as far as our progress with opening up the state and opening up tourism to the rest of the world. Fantastic. Thanks, Scott. Harvey, could you share a little bit about, obviously, um, I know in New York, uh, I saw a lot, of, a lot of news coverage about Las Vegas and trying to get the strip open as soon as possible. Could you talk a little bit about sort of the, uh, how the government's uh, mandates have impacted your business? I think I already talked a little bit about, you know, the, the oversized project of basically closing the property, but, you know, from a, a sales division, we were tasked with reaching out to every group, every client, every third party to start the conversation about what was going on. And we had many cancel, you know, right away, uh, you know, citing force majeure. And then many wanted to move further into 2020, 21, 2022. So we had a lot of you know, lift and shift going on. Um, 
And it was, it was really a massive undertaking of coordination, trying to get a hold of everyone and figure out where they're going to go. Uh, someone to kind of hang around and see what was going to happen. So they wanted daily, weekly updates. Uh, the wedding market, you know, was turned into instant chaos, which is a big, a big market for us. And uh, I would say group dining lost about 40% of their business in the two weeks since we closed in, in March for the rest of 2020. So it took an instant hit as citywide and, and all the convention business started to cancel. Now, again, we've been through this before, you know, we've had other closures, as I mentioned, partially and, you know, recessions hit to Vegas, uh, but this was a tidal wave of action. Um, and, and I think for us, the biggest difference on this occasion was we didn't have the answers. You know, we, we, we were in a situation where we're supposed to give our client answers and direction. And if we don't, our competitors will take the business. But the reality was this time, no one, ourselves, our clients, um, our competition really knew what the future was. And we really mostly thought uh, we were closing for two to four weeks initially. No one expected three months. And I think as you look back, by the time this really starts to bottom out, it's going to be 18 months of you know, full and partial closures you know, when you look back in history. But I think our biggest learning curve was, was learning to work in the current and, and literally based on what local and, and state governor government uh, was advising us. We had to think differently about how to work with our clients. Uh, you know, I got to be honest, no one was calling us looking for you know, menus or tastings or diagrams or load-in schedules. Every call after the initial call was about health and safety measures. What were we doing to, you know, for the health and safety, if they were to do a, a meeting for our, our guests, our staff, you know, and that really became the number one question. So, you know, out of that need and, and conjunction with local and state government, we had to come up with a plan as, as you know, I think all companies did eventually. And at MGM, it was called the seven point plan. And, and it's really interesting because what it looked at was, you know, the connection to each other, to, to bodies, to people that we so often took for granted in the past, you know, like screening and temperature checks, uh, masks, you know, personal uh, protection equipment, six foot distancing, hand washing and, and enhanced sanitation, uh, the heating, the ventilation, the air conditioning, and not only that, but air control and flow. And then how was the incident response protocol set up? So that if we did find someone who, who tested positive or had an issue, what do we do? And then of course, digital innovation. So, you know, that seven point plan really became the basis for our reopening and how we and, you know, whatever other properties and hotel companies in Vegas called that it really was our ability to return our business to a somewhat safe to a certain extent. But I gotta tell you, you know, working in the current, it was a critical thought change process you know, instead of advising clients what they could do and get out of the box, we really had to stay inside the box of what we could do based on, uh, you know, safety and government regulations. We had to put away our creative hats, you know, take those off and put them away for a little bit um, and only work within the current and the limitations that were set up in the current. And they moved a lot. You know, when we reopened, we had a strict uh, 10 person, no more. And then it, it started to get moderate and uh, you start to look at pods of people, not crossing over, percentage of occupancy. At one point we hit 50% occupancy of restaurants and convention space at a maximum of 50 people, six people per second, two inch round table, 15 feet apart. And then it went to 250 people, no more than four concurrent sessions up to a thousand, that was in our best days. And then with everything going on now, we've been reduced uh, to 25% capacity with uh, no more than 50 people and no more than four per table. So, it, you know, it, it takes a lot out to constantly change the current and call our clients and try to rebook and try and move the needle. But that's the, that's the business we're in right now. And, you know, it's very fluid, but, um, you know, the heart of it is our health and safety plan. And we know with the vaccine coming and, and the business outlooks for the second half of 2021, things are getting better. Thanks, Harvey. I think you, you allude to our, our, our next topic is, I know in some of our previous conversations, the four of us have discussed some of the innovations or strategies um, that you all have uh, you know, implemented or had to look at to deal with some of the impacts of the pandemic, whether it was um, you know, closing the hotels, um, furloughing employees, um, or how to handle uh, guests during this time. So 
I guess I'd like to explore that a little bit. So I'll start with Rick. Um, Rick, can you talk a little bit about maybe some of the, the strategies or innovations that you've used to address sort of the impact of the pandemic on your property in the Keys? I think the communication is the most important. You, you have to be able to um, convey to the guest in, in a way that makes them feel comfortable that you're doing everything possible to, to ensure their safety that you are um, following the guidelines. There's, there's so much information in a situation like this. There's so much information that's coming at you from the local chambers to the local hotel association to the governor's office. There's so much information. Um, some comes out before it's officially released. Some afterwards, everybody has a different idea. Um, and you really have to formulate a, a, a message to give to the guests, whether it's in monthly e-blasts, on social media, in um, pre-stay emails, right up to when they arrive in the registration process. You, you have to be very, very clear with them. Um, your websites need to be updated continually as well, uh, just to meet the expectations that they have. Um, also, the, the phone calls. Um, you know, where Harvey was alluding to just that you're not booking business. You're answering a lot of questions. You know, all the revenue doesn't always substantiate how much the phone's ringing, but people want to know what you're doing, how you are, how you're handling it, um, and they're, they're also thinking about the the team as well. We've gotten a lot of positive praise about how we're handling it. You're doing everything that you can, and we see that a lot in comments, whether it's on social media, um, or emails, or even on reviews. Um, but that, that renewed focus on the safety of the guests, but also the team members is, is really, really critical. And it has to shine through everywhere. You have to look at, at every possible touch point from a guest perspective and understand the risks that are associated with it and as, establish some accountability for it. Um, because that's probably one of the biggest changes too, is their accountability. Um, that, that comes along with, with this responsibility. So um, it's one that we've tackled and it's, it's one that's always evolving. The letters, the, the pre-registration emails are constantly changing. Uh, the information that we give guests is constantly changing. The hours of operation of the outlets changes, I would say weekly on, on just a, um, on a business level. You know, it could be on a Monday it could be very busy and the following Monday, it could be cricket. So you have to be able to adapt, but communicate those changes so that the expectations can be met. Fantastic. I'll go back to Harvey. I know Harvey, we, you've talked about the, the digital um, strategies, but if you could emphasize maybe some of the other strategies or, or that one in general, um, how the Bellagio or MGM resorts in general has um, implemented you know, innovations or strategies to sort of attack these, these impacts? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we all understood that in order to get back to business, there's going to be a ramp up of some sort. And, and, you know, for the convention business, that ramp up would need to be a combination of hybrid and, and in-person meetings. But to make in-person meetings possible, we had to develop a program. And, and again, I think, you know, all companies started to do this uh, in, in respectfully a lot. There's a lot of great stuff out there. What MGM did was uh, develop a convene with confidence program. And this program built on our seven point plan that I discussed earlier and, you know, is subject to all the state and local reg regulations and restrictions. But what it did was, was it partnered with Impact Health to offer clients and guests a multi-layered health screening option and a rapid on-site molecular COVID test. And then those results were delivered securely to each participant's phone via Clear, which is the biometric secure identity company. A lot of times, you know, we see Clear at the airport. So you could get your health pass from Clear through Impact Health, which would let you go into a meeting. And this was all done in 30 minutes or less. Um, and we felt we were doing was we were kind of, you know, creating parameters for these meetings. And some people call it bubbles, but, you know, we weren't locking them in. Um, but because this was a molecular test, and, and you know, very rarely molecular done within within 30 minutes, it was able to understand the virus at the at the simplest and and most 
uh, smallest molecular level. So before it's become contagious. So, you know, you could convene with confidence that you are, you are, you know, safe. Um, you know, the reality is that, you know, testing is expensive initially. So in order to, to bring this to, you know, to market for every group, it, it's got to come down in price. And, you know, we're hoping that the technology as it gets better and faster, it also get less expensive because, you know, all groups can't afford this price point. And we can't afford to underwrite it for, you know, for all groups. So, you know, but, but convene with confidence is a way to get back to business, keeping health and safety at the forefront and still working with state and local uh, entities. So uh, that's, that's what we're doing. Fantastic. Scott, how about the resort in Hawaii? How have you sort of implemented some strategies to, to manage some of the impacts? Sure, well, well for us, again, uh, going back to Rick's point, it's about communication in the form of marketing, us, we're getting out the word that Hawaii is quote unquote, the safest destination in the world, as far as our, our level of containment and everything else. And that our hotel is also one of the safest hotels in the world. So we market our strengths. Our strengths are our rooms, our condominiums. So they have full kitchens. So you don't have to go to a restaurant every night for every meal. You can cook in your room as often or as little as you like. Our restaurants are open air. We don't have four walls surrounding any restaurant here at the hotel. So that in and of itself gives you a sense of confidence to come and stay with us. Um, I think that for us, the, the level of cleanliness that we provide because we're a five-star hotel, our ADR is higher we're able to bring on more housekeepers as a result of that uh, because our margins allow for it. So we can guarantee a level of cleanliness that I think is now far more important to the consumer than it was prior to the pandemic. Not sure. to say cleanliness has never not been important, but if we think in terms of what's important to the consumer now, it's cleanliness, it's safety. If, it's, if I bring my family, are they going to be safe? You know, I think the terms of importance or, or what constitutes uh, the decision makers, you know, choices, those things have changed a bit. So we get that out into our marketing foray. We communicate very closely with our partners um, and our brand uh, in general make sure that that message is, is shared very clearly. And it puts us in a good position, about as good as you can be considering the circumstances. Sure, fantastic, thanks. Well, I know we've all been reading about, or at least I have, you know, some forecasting of, you know, permanent changes or things that, that might stay on well past the pandemic. So I'd like to, to address that as our sort of last formal uh, question. So I'll go back to Harvey, sort of looking at, um, looking into the future a little bit and, and some of the things that have gone on now, what are some long-term changes that you think might come out of the pandemic? Sure. You know, I, I think somewhat concerning to say, but you know, technology in general is gonna be the clear winner here. And I'll, I'll take you outside the uh, convention area for a moment, but you know, look at the hotel division and, and kind of think about the guest check-in process. Prior to the pandemic, our remote check-in, what we call digital key technology, uh, as far as a desire to achieve and support and fund was maybe at a scale of two. And customer appreciation and acceptance was as low, you know, maybe three to 10% of arrivals would engage. Average in and out to the hotel are between 15 to 2,500 uh, 2, 500, uh, covers a day so, you know, at 5% of 2,000 rooms, you're talking about 100 rooms using digital key. But the pandemic caused an immediate shift. You know, we realized that guests would not want to stand in line to check in, which is often what happens when you have 25, you know, 30 front desk staff working and you got, you know, you got 2,000 people checking in. If you do the math, there's going to be a line. So that technological advance happened quickly and we moved it from a from two I would say a nine before reopening. And I would say post opening 30 to 50% of our guests are using digital key. 
Now we realize that number is going to meander a little bit as more of our regular, you know, somewhat older, maybe less tech savvy customers come back as, as we start to normalize. But I don't think digital key is going away anytime soon. I think the business travel and the convention groups will love it and, and engage in it. And, and, and you think about it, this change, you know, about how people check in, but it starts to affect the front desk, the concierge, the bell desk labor models and how much real estate you really need for the front desk. You start to think about it in that term. Um, and these are gonna change what the hotel looks like when guests arrive in the future. Um, and then, you know, we, we think that getting guests into a room quicker and, and using algorithms to understand when they're gonna arrive. So X number of rooms are ready and kind of work from that perspective. That'll help them start the resort experience sooner. And, you know, and we feel that's gonna increase the enjoyment of the resort. And, and potentially increase additional uh, and overall spend because people don't like to start gambling and drinking until they're checked in. They know they got the room and pack a little bit, freshen up. So I think this, you know, this whole model is going to change how the resort operates and, and how Las Vegas operates in, in, in a way. Uh, at the food and beverage level, QR codes and technology have you know, found a, resurg a resurgence. Um, you know, working at 25% capacities, you have to make a reservation to get into these, these restaurants. You can't just show up. It's, it's tough because they're so limited in seating numbers. So by using QR codes and other technology, we can actually interface with the customer and let them know there's a wait, let them know how long. And you know, if, for example, if Prime has a 45 minute wait and Spago doesn't, we can help move them over to that restaurant, which you know, helps our labor and helps spread out that, that reservation business. So not one restaurant is getting you know, all the business that everyone accordingly throughout the property is. So great technology there. And, and then again, just come back to the convention business for a moment. You know, we talked about testing technology. Uh, we talked about, you know, hybrid meetings going to be the thing of the future. But we're using QR codes in, in, in the um, convention space. You know, people don't want to touch menus. So, you know, we can use a QR code. They can pull it up on their menu. There's a number there if they need to have a special meal or special needs met. They can just call in. We have a person manning that phone number so that we can give, you know, better service and take special meals and special needs of our customers out of the hands of the meeting planners who don't have time for it or may not find it important. And then if you go back to my last point, if you go back to the digital key, you know, in the old days and, and you know, with a, a real key, you'd have to change the, the you know, the lug to, to change out the key if you want to key off a room for a meeting plan that might have, you know, high end or, or you know, expensive items in their, in their office. And over time, we've moved to uh, the hotel uh, key card, which is used for general hotel rooms. And, and that's great as well. But if you can use this, this digital technology put on their phones, you can actually just give it to the client you know, directly and let them access their, their staff room whenever they want. And you can, keep, you can get a bit of tracking. Who goes in there? What time it was locked? What time it was unlocked? But if you're not careful, this technology takes away the hospitality. You no longer have to meet the client and give them the keys. So you have to be careful that you know, the technology, which makes it easier, doesn't take away from the hospitality experience, which is so important to all of us on the call, I think, today. Um, so we're working on trying to get a system where it will ping us when they unlock the door. So we know they're in the office. We know who's in the office. We can go when the right person's there to see that person bring them what they need, if it's their favorite coffee or, or paperwork that they're looking for. So I, I, I definitely think technology is the winner. We just really not, now need to think critically how to make it right for hospitality and not the other way around. That, that's an excellent point. Thanks. Rick, thinking about um, either the, the keys or your operation in Florida or just in general, what do you, what do you see as possibly some changes that are, are here to stay because of the pandemic or things you see coming down the pipeline? Um, I, I think the technology is certainly uh, coming to stay. Um, I wish it was coming faster. I wish we had the, uh, the keyless check-in. <laughs> Currently, I have to wash all the keys now. So uh, I think that is, that's a, a big change that's coming. But also, the the hospitality division and that experience should be cleaner and safer than it's ever been before. I think from a, from a confidence standpoint, I think that's, uh, it's being shown by the guests who are coming that that's, that's what they're, uh, they're seeing is that there's a, a renewed attention to those 
to those types of details that are important for them. Um, you know, cleanliness, accountability, as uh, Scott was saying, is there are no exceptions when it comes to that in the guest's mind. If something does not meet their expectations, we'll let you know for sure. Um, but I think from an efficiency standpoint as well, uh, there is a new barometer in the hospitality business, and that is to be efficient or you don't survive. Um, those that are that are able to to be creative with scheduling and multi um, multitasking in different departments are going to be the ones that are most successful um, because there is it's a, a shrinking um, profit gap at this point where you have to do more with less. Um, and I think from a from an associate standpoint, they they see the benefits to that as well. They're gathering cross training, they're picking up different skills that they normally wouldn't have seen. Um, but from a guest perspective as well on the cleanliness side, you're, you're seeing um, services that were automatic before like room cleaning is now on request. You're starting to see some shifts and things that, that have been automatic where some of the brands are, are backing off on them. Um, and, and the guests are, are appreciating it. They're like, I can call for assistance if I need it. Um, you don't need to come in and change the sheets every day. Um, so we're seeing a little bit more of a, of a push towards that, that efficiency side, um, which should help, help the bottom line. Fantastic. Scott, I'll finish up with you. What are, what are your thoughts on maybe some changes that you see happening as a result of the pandemic or some of the current uh, changes or modifications that might be, might be here to stay? Sure. I think, you know, the, the advent of, of these Zoom calls and, and, working remotely on the corporate side. Uh, the big question being, when will corporate and business travel return to these larger metropolitan locations? Um, you know, we all like to think that, you know, people are social beings and, and we have this innate desire to get together. And I, I believe that's the case. And I believe that over time, those, that, that, that concept of business travel will return uh, but the big question I think for many is how long is that going to take and have companies decided that the money saved by not traveling, uh, you know, how much does that assist their bottom line as they start to come out of this, um, this situation with their, with their own businesses. So big question mark around corporate and business travel on the leisure travel side. I was reading an article yesterday that likened uh, the pent up demand to popping a, a champagne cork. You know, uh, people believe that once we get the uh, virus under control, that people are gonna get out, they're gonna start to travel. Leisure destinations are gonna be the beneficiaries. People are just who wanna get out of their house and, and vacation and enjoy life uh, after such a long period of, of sobering reality. So in that instance, you know, we have to make sure that we're prepared for them. And I, I think this concept uh, of space utilization and social distancing and how hotels have had to adjust their existing operations to comply with that, I think that's gonna go forward as an expectation in the future. So not only for existing properties, but new builds and and when people or, or businesses renovate properties, I think the concept of space as a luxury is going to be incorporated. I, I have a hard time envisioning going back to cramped quarters, so to speak, and maximizing the number of covers out of a restaurant, for instance, in a hotel environment. Um, and, and I think to a certain degree, you know, some of these, some of the, I guess the, the leftovers of this whole situation are, are going to be with us for many years. No, that's an interesting point that both you and Harvey brought up is that that space dynamic. And, and I, I think that truly will be the case that, you know, some customers will, while things seem to be getting better and be safer, will still feel much better knowing that there is that distance and those safety standards still, still available. Well, we're working perfect with our timing here. So I'm going to um, jump to some questions here. I guess um, 
kind of alluding to um, Scott's um, point about the the coming, hopefully, popping of the cork here and uh, getting back to our leisure destinations. What are some of your thoughts, um, either from Harvey, Rick, or again, Scott, when do you think sort of your business will come back to sort of the 2019, 2020 uh, peak peak business? Any any guesses? I just I, yeah I, I'll I'll address it if I may, but I just want to say to Scott, you know that that popping the cork, you know we we talk about in terms of I understand now what the roaring twenties are all about. <laughs> right. uh, it's going to be it's going to be fun when we're we're through this and you know we will get through it. Um, you know, we see our second half of the year being, you know, being our strongest in the year, uh, certainly not back to normal, um, you know, and, and we're seeing conventions hold and we're seeing um, good signs, you know, for that third quarter into the fourth quarter, which right now is a stellar quarter giving, you know, the last, you know, the last year and by then, you know, uh, six, six periods, but it's too early to tell because what we find is that as, as customers need to make decisions, that's when they start to, you know, cancel or, or you know, cut back. Um, and there's, there's a myriad of, of reasons that, you know, a, a, an event will go on, will, won't go on. And there's so many stakeholders in that event. I think Scott alluded to with that, you know, are companies budgeting for these events this year? Are they budgeting to the same level? Um, you know, do they want their, their uh, clients and, and their customers and, and you know, their, their employees to really be flying? But, you know, if we, had to, if we had to be hopeful right now, we would say, uh, the base will be in third quarter going into fourth quarter. You know, from the uh, economic experts uh, that study our destination here in Hawaii uh, are predicting that we will return to 2019 levels in 2024. Wow. Which, you know, is, you know, on one point, okay, there's a lot of data to support that. Um, on the other hand, just you just hope that the resiliency of the human spirit and and that we get a get a, a handle on this thing so that people can feel comfortable going about their lives as they did prior and and so we have 2024 but i'm i sure i'm hoping for 2022 but i'll be honest with you great rick how about in florida any any thoughts on, on your business and and when you think things might get back to sort of the 1920 um business? I think from a from a Florida Keys standpoint, it's a little smaller of a market, a bit smaller of a market than um, than Hawaii and also with um, with Las Vegas. So we, we have a major metropolitan area with Miami. Uh, we've seen, you know, there's the September was a very busy for us uh, with no hurricanes. And so it doesn't take much to, to really push it into a higher area. We haven't you know, I mean, our, our quieter months are in the 40s, 40% 40 range versus our busy months are in the 99% range. So um, we were hopeful during the budgeting process that, you know, we would have an okay Q1 that's kind of soft right now. Um, so we're looking into Q3 to be back to somewhat normalcy, um, not in a, probably on a uh, extended ADR basis um, with some of the gains that we've seen year over year over year. Um, but I think from a competitive standpoint and, and to get back some of the staffing levels, we'll probably be into 21, or I mean, deep into 21, 22. Thanks. Um, another question here relates to, I think the, the limited service relative to um, your, your properties, especially the luxury properties. I'm um, familiar with all of your properties, um, been to all of your properties. You know, you have high standards, you have a very high um, rating. Um, how, how has been the feedback from consumers when you're limiting services, closing services, uh, changing the hours? How, how have the, um, the overall guest feedback been when they're staying at a five-star property, but maybe not having all the five-star amenities and services available. Yeah, I, I think, at least for us, uh, people have been very understanding. They, they get it. They watch the news. They know what's going on. Uh, and 
communicate with them prior to their arrival so they know exactly what they're walking into. They know the bar is closed. They know room service is available, but it's drop and go only. Uh, you know, they know the pool's open, but it's limited service. So we make sure to reach out to each individual guest uh, just to make sure that there'll be no surprises when they arrive. Yeah, I, I would agree with, uh, with Scott. You know, I think it's, it's about communication. We talked about it a little bit before as well. Um, they're, they're happy to be out. You know, they're happy to be, you know, a lot of our, our business has been the drive-in market. Uh, we'll see what happens now that California is actually locked down, but, you know, they're just glad to be out and have a place to go. And they realize it is limited. We've done a good job, I think, you know, trying not to change things left and right, because it, it is very difficult. And it was something that we had to do initially, but we've standardized as much as possible our hours of service and kind of uh, took it to a volume uh, matrix. But, um, you know, I think the hardest thing will be New Year's in, in Las Vegas. You, you can't dance, no fireworks, but please come out and have a, have a ton of fun. Um, so it's, you know, it's those that I think are tough days, but people still enjoy getting out, sitting by the pool, relaxing, unwinding, getting out of their, their normal environment. And I think really what it comes down to is service levels, is, is the staff has to be welcoming even more so than usual, it has to really appreciate you know, one thing about the, the 19s and even the 18s was it was churn and burn. It was fast. It was it was nonstop. But now we have time, even though it's a limited, more limited staff, it's also more limited guest count. So you have time to take care of them. You have time to give better service, more attention to detail. And now's the time to really, you know, to really work the hospitality aspect of the business if you're going to survive. Great. Thanks. And the fact, I'll just add, the fact that everybody's wearing masks, right? You lose that, that connection, that smile, that, that welcoming, in our case, sense of aloha. So, so you have to turn the dial up on the service delivery. Rick, do you want to add anything to that? I think they're all, all great points. Um, I think that it's, you know, it's, it's tough to, to really put a barometer on how that's going to change. Um, I agree. Fantastic. Let's see, looking at other questions here. I think you touched upon, some of you touched upon this a little bit, but there's this question related to uh, technological solutions um, and the future of labor and labor costs. So I know Rick, you talked about efficiency and, and Harvey, you talked about some of this. Can you, can you talk about maybe a little bit further, you know, how you're handling labor and technology and the, the pros and cons of, of that? I think from a, um, from a labor standpoint, there's some great tools that we've integrated with time and attendance and scheduling, you know, forecasting becomes even more critical. You have to look at um, whether there's walk-in traffic, the weather comes into play, um, bookings. You're looking at, especially in a very transient market, our rates change multiple times. You could have, have days where there's a lot of walk-ins um, and some days where the forecast doesn't come together. So you have to be flexible on, on where you're using staff. Um, again, the cross utilization of staff is important too, where, um, you know, you have to be able to be flexible. There's some days where we use, uh, somebody might work a double, um, and then you bring in another person the next day. Other days, they, uh, you know, they might get an extra day off. Um, it's, it's tough to manage, but you do have to keep, uh, to keep an eye on it at all times. Um, overtime is, is easy to get out of, easy to get away from you. Um, getting the team out early, but it's a, it's a whole, in my case, it's a whole complex wide um, where we share staff amongst all the hotels, uh, the service staff and the outlets go to different areas. They're trained in different areas, um, but it's one where, um, you know, when you do have a situation where you furloughed a large group, 
um, and it extends into a period like this, there's a bit of uncertainty on whether or not they're available to come back when you need them. Um, so you do need your, your best and your brightest at all times. Um, and that's something that we talk about in, in team huddles and weekly meetings is that we have to make sure that the team is taken care of uh, because they are, they're the life bread of the, of the operation and they're, um, they're providing that service and you have to make sure they're taken care of and they're giving the guests everything because efficiency is most important. Uh, when you're thin, you feel every bump on the road. Um, so, so they have, they understand that, that importance of, you know, when it's time to go, we got to go. Um, but on the same, same token, they are, they're all in when it's, when they have to stay. Great. I, I, if, whether it be Scott, uh, Harvey or, or Rick, uh, thinking about the vaccine, um, you know, coming in the near future, has there been some discussion about how, um, that may become a requirement with your staff or how that might affect sort of requirements of employment. Um, you know, here at RIT, you know, we've, we've mandated uh, the, the, flu vac the flu shot this year for the first time, even though RIT has always supported it strongly and, and many, many faculty and staff um, and students get that being up here in the Northeast, but any thoughts about the vaccine and, and its, its role in employment? Or if you can't share it, it's okay. That's, that's, a, that's a tough one to answer, uh, Rick. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, you go a couple different ways with that question. I think we, we want the environment possible uh, without impeding upon the rights of our associates and our employees to, to make the decision that, that they feel most comfortable with. Um, yeah, I'm not so sure mandate is in our near future, um, but we'll see as things progress. Right. Yeah, I, I would agree. And, and you know, we have not really heard anything on, on the planning of it. I'm sure it's still in C-suite discussions and you know, there's a lot of layers. You got unions, you got to make sure there's enough vaccine when it, whatever program you come out with, you can't mandate it or request it or whatever the term you're going to use or, or, or work with and not have enough of it. And I, you know, and you know, we're thankful it's coming, but it's not here yet to really know how much we have and who's, you know, it's still working and who's first. So I think we're a little bit off from that, that discussion at an operational hotel level. Great, I'll try to squeeze in one more question from, from the question and answer section. Um, Question is, can you elaborate more on the high touch, high tech balance in the long term? I know, Scott, you mentioned the, the challenge that, and I find this in teaching, you know, you can't really see someone's expression if they're wearing a mask. And Harvey, I know you talked about, you know, giving someone the keys to their, their suite or their office suite um, gives that personal connection, a chance to welcome them. Um, Rick, I know, you know, interacting with guests on vacation down in the keys, that personal touch is all key. Um, and some of you maybe touch a little bit further into sort of how you're balancing the, the tech aspect that's, that as Harvey mentioned is the winner and, and still provide that hospitality. I no one wants to go, Rick. No one wants to answer that one. <laughs> no one wants this one. These are not, these are not my questions, no. I think from a, from an aspect with the guests, they're, they're expecting some type of technological advance, whether it is the, I think the big one that is coming a bit faster than the RFIDs and the, the keyless check-in is the mobile check-in, um, where you provide a guest the, the credit card information that they can enter. And really once they arrive, you give them their, their key pack and they're off and, and go. It, it really takes that, um, you know, where you, where you may have a line of, of a hundred people at a check-in to, to really a, a minute, a minute, a piece of an interaction versus in some cases at some of our hotels, it can be a three to five minute process to explain how to get to this restaurant and the hours of this and how do the towels return? Um, and that's a great point too. We've also incorporated uh, RFID towel trackers in some of our areas to, to limit some of those touch points of, 
of the pool towel, uh, where those go. So uh, a guest actually has that, has it on a wristband that they, they can take as many towels as they want, which they'll be charged for if they don't return them. Uh, they're all impregnated with an RFID and uh, through, through osmosis, I guess, it all and charges them um, and it registers when it comes back. So I think little touches like this, which um, show that, that we're moving forward in a, in a technological area, but still provides for the guest without taking away from an experience. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's still fundamentally a people business. We're not quite at the, the level of the Jetsons, if anyone remembers that cartoon, right? We're, we're, we're still, it's very much about relationships. It's very much about um, interacting. And uh, while I think we'll be able to augment that with certain advances, I, I, don't, I don't see that as a fundamental important part of hospitality. I don't see that changing. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I, and I think, you know, that, that early, you, know, you got to have that balance. You know, I, I think about golf, you know, in the old days, you take a caddy out who can read the greens and tell you what to do. And now you get on a cart and it tells you how far you are from the center and it calculates everything for you. So now you just got to blame the cart instead of the caddy for a bad shot. But, it, you know, it's, it's when you get back to the clubhouse, they ask how it went. They still interact. You know, did, did it help you? They, they still, you know, they still offer hospitality and I think at every point of contact and there are there are so many points of contact in all of our resorts that you have to have that human touch and, and that that just that sheer desire to want to it's a, it's a, it's a it's a pleasing business it's a service business and you know Serbian leadership has to be at every point of contact so technology can help but it can't do the job for you that's a perfect ending, Harvey. Thanks. I, we've, we've come to the end and it went by quick for me and I hope it went by quick for you. So I'm going to, again, thank you for your so support tonight and all of your past support that the three of you have given RIT and, and the hospitality and tourism management program. So again, many thanks. And I'm going to turn it back over to Bill. Yes. Uh, thank you all of you for the excellent uh, discussion this evening. Uh, all audience members will receive an email from us in about a week with a link to today's webinar recording. You can view a full listing of our upcoming virtual events at the website that I'm putting in the chat window right now. We have several this month, and we'd like to include you in as many of these events as possible. Uh, thank you so much from all of us here at RIT um, Saunders. Uh, have a wonderful evening and have a safe holiday season. Thank you, everyone. Fantastic. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Harvey. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.